Welcome to each of the witnesses. Um, let me start, uh, Mr. Stallmer, with a couple of questions for you. Um, as you note in your testimony, uh, although the number of launches has increased in the past five years from 12 to 32, uh, that number pales in comparison to the roughly 15.5 million flights that, that transit the national airspace in a given year. Uh, given this dramatic disparity in frequency, uh, as well as the maturity of the traditional aviation sector as com compared to the commercial space flight sector. Uh, does it make sense in your judgment to treat commercial space flight exactly the same as traditional aviation for, for the purpose uh, of national airspace integration? Uh, thank you very much for that question, Senator. <clears throat> I think at the time, no. I don't think they, they can be compared the same. And let me give you a, a few quick examples. Uh, in the past, past week alone, um, out of Texas, in, southwest, uh, in western Texas, Blue Origin recently uh, launched and landed uh, their New Shepard uh, launch vehicle, um, a vehicle that wasn't around um, f six years ago, five, five, five years ago, if that. Uh, SpaceX just recently launched a, a mission to the uh, International Space Station uh, carrying uh, crew uh, cargo to the International Space Station. Uh, a year and a half ago, SpaceX launched the Falcon Heavy uh, launch vehicle that landed two boosters successfully um, back to Earth. This had never been done before. Uh, we have new entrants that are, I shouldn't say new entrants, but new concepts, new capabilities that are entering the market uh, at a rapid pace that are all very unique. So the maturity of our industry, although we are making rapid advances, I don't think that we should fall under the same uh, guidelines and, and rules that an industry that has been a very robust industry for the past 50 or 60 years have fallen under those same rules. So I think it takes a little more time. I like the regime that we have right now with the FAA's Office of Commercial Space Transportation, uh, the licensing procedures, the permitting procedures, and how they, they've been working with industry and regulating industry. I think that's the ideal approach as it's a crawl, walk, run. The industry is doing outstanding, but there's a lot of unique uh, entrants into the industry, and it's, uh, it's only going to continue to grow. And, and we need that support to help it continue to grow. Uh, Mr. Monteith, uh, as you know, t Title 51 uh, in the U.S. Code directs the Sec Secretary of Transportation to, quote, encourage, facilitate, and promote commercial space launches and reentries by the private sector. Um, how important is that statutory mandate, and, and how, um, how does DOT go about complying with it? Thank you, Mr. Senator. Um, first off, I would tell you that, that the best way for us to enable, uh, facilitate, and promote the industry is to ensure that we have the right regulations at the right scope at the right time. Uh, the worst thing we can do for this industry is overregulate to the point where we are not increasing uh, effectiveness of public safety, but we are creating hurdles to uh, either new innovative technologies uh, or putting undue uh, bureaucratic overhead on our existing companies. Uh, as far as the uh, what we call EFP uh, specifically, uh, the way that that we in the department. Uh, uh, carry out those responsibilities are primarily through our engagement with industry, uh, with organizations like Mr. Stalmers. Uh, and that way, we understand what industry is doing. We listen to uh, their concerns, uh, where we should focus, and quite frankly, where we can get better in our processes, uh, primarily related to the length of time it takes to license an operation uh, without compromising safety. Okay, um, Mr. Lovering, uh, according to a report published by Deloitte in, in July of 2018, uh, the market for vertical takeoff and landing vehicles is, is burgeoning at a meteoric rate. The report estimates that the market will be worth $21 billion by 2035. Uh, the report also states that the global unmanned traffic management market is expected to grow at a compounded annual growth rate of over 20%. Uh, from 2019 to 2025, um, all of which will mean more jobs and more opportunity for Americans. 
Mr. Lovering, in, in your judgment, how will the growth in, in the UAS market benefit Texas and, and, and the nation more broadly? Uh, thank you, Senator Cruz. Um, UAM really is, uh, um, while it is focused today on, on, er, on launching urban uh, access to the skies, um, this is just the beginning. So in your state partic in particular, um, we've already seen a lot of activity around Dallas and, the inter uh, and interest there. Um, there's obviously lots of other cities that, that, that will be uh, uh, very interesting for us to explore. And I think while in the beginning we're looking at having city integration for these services, uh, as battery technology improves, as the battery costs come down, um, we're looking at being able to expand this to more and more areas. So we, maybe we'll start off in urban areas, but then eventually suburban and rural areas. So really seeing this as being able to, to access a, a wide range of, of people um, in the cities and also in rural areas. Thank you.